Welcome to my talk, Models and Service Layers, Hemoglobin and Hobgoblins. And I promise by the end of it, the title will make sense. My name is Ross Tuck, and my job is to keep you awake after lunch. So a little bit about myself by way of introduction. Uh, I'm an independent engineer, coach, consultant. You can find me on Twitter and Freenode as creatively Ross Tuck. I also have a website and a blog. You get the idea. Okay. So I'm here today to talk to you about a topic that's important for web developers, no matter who you are, what you do, specifically hemoglobin. Now, if you're not familiar with hemoglobin, it's a substance in your blood, and I mean you specifically in the eighth row, you have it in your blood. Um, if you don't have enough of it or it doesn't work properly, you probably have a medical condition known as anemia because hemoglobin's job is to carry iron throughout the body. And if you don't have enough iron, you're kind of pale and sickly looking. It's, it's not a good look. But this disease isn't limited to just people and parcel tongues. Objects can be anemic too, except instead of iron, they're missing behavior or logic. This is what makes strong objects. Let me give you an example. Uh, this is a model like you'd see in any PHP application. You know that right away for two reasons. One, I labeled it in the top left corner. Two, it's made up entirely of getters and setters. Uh, you know exactly what the internal structure of this object looks like. It's got a name, it's got a status, it's got a bunch of tasks, all right? Uh, it is basically a big data container. There is no behavior here. I mean, sure, in a modern PHP framework, maybe you've got an adder and not just a getter and a setter, but for all intents and purposes, you could replace this with this, and you'd be the same minus a little bit of type checking. This is generally regarded to be a bad thing, TM, but no one will believe you if you say something about objects unless you bring a Martin Fowler quote, so I picked this one. It says, in essence, the problem with anemic domain models is that they incur all of the costs of a domain model without yielding any of the benefits. In other words, you sat down and thought up what all the models in your application were, you thought up uh, what their properties were, how they were connected to each other, and so on and so forth, but you didn't put actually anything in there to enforce that or actually even use it really in any way, which is kind of a waste. This leads to the unfortunate conclusion that our industry standard is an anti-pattern. Now, an important note before we go any further. I am, for all intents and purposes, an idiot, okay? I am not here with some sort of divine revelation about how to build your code, because guess what? I'm still figuring it out too. What I wanna offer you today, instead of advice, is a buffet. I wanna show you a line you can walk down and sample several different ways of building your application. And maybe you like some of them, maybe you don't. Like any good buffet, this is essentially judgment-free. You can decide if you like it or you don't. And we're also not gonna talk about if it's good or bad, and we're not gonna go really in depth with any one thing. You're just gonna try a little bit of each one so that at the end of the day, you'll know enough to go further on your own and, and hopefully make it at your own house, okay? I'm also not gonna talk too much about the models themselves. A lot of what I'm gonna discuss is often associated with domain-driven design, which is really, really awesome. But today, I'm gonna talk about the stuff around the models instead. I'm gonna focus on integration over implementation of strong domain models, okay? Now, because I'm gonna show you several different ways of building something, it helps if I have a common setup so that you can follow its evolution. So I'm gonna stick with this to-do list thing because it's bonkers simple. It has a name, it has a status, and it has zero or more tasks, okay? And the tasks themselves are even simpler. They have a description and a priority. Everybody with me? Okay. Now, I'm gonna show you how to build this stuff using an ORM that's totally not doctrine to, I promise, and a framework that's absolutely not symphony to, Mm -hmm. Okay, there's some flavor of that in here, but you can build anything and everything I show you from scratch in some, something else, <coughs> Drupal, um, whatever you like, okay? So I'm gonna start off with kind of a CRUD application. That's how we build most PHP stuff today, right? And we're gonna begin in the controller because that's where most of the action is when you do CRUD. So we're gonna have this add task action. It takes an HTTP request as its first parameter. And what we're gonna do is create a new task and attach it to an existing to-do list. And this is the example we'll use throughout the rest of the presentation. Okay, so I'm gonna take my time with this code. The first thing we're gonna do is we need to create a new task, all right? And here, I'm just gonna get the task, I'm gonna set some stuff on it, and this is really simple. I know in real life you'd have some uh, validation or something like that here, you'd probably be using a form library or a serializer, but it basically boils down to the same thing, it's on the same layer of code. Next, I'm gonna take a to-do repository, and I'm gonna look for the existing to-do list inside of it. So we're gonna do a find by ID there. If the to-do list doesn't exist, we throw an exception, a 404, and then we set the to-do list on the task. This should be your first hint, by the way, that something is bass backwards. Because, right, if the task belongs to the to-do list, then why are we putting the to-do list on task? 
I mean, it makes sense when you think about it from a database perspective because this is a parent-child kind of relationship and you know that you need the parent ID on the child row. But that's a database concern. It doesn't really belong all the way up here in what's basically UI logic. But we'll talk about that a little later on. After we set the whole thing up, we need to save it. We'll use a repository for that. That just flushes it to the database. And then we'll have some application-specific concerns like updating an audit log, maybe we send a new email, and then finally we redirect the user back to the edit page. Okay, So I'll let you look at that real quick because we're going to slice and dice this a lot. Everybody good? Cool. Ish. Now, your first impression is probably correct. All right. And this is not just the aesthetics, although those are important too. I mean, I can't even fit the closing bracket on the bottom of the slide for God's sake. All right? But there's some real technical concerns here. The model is thoroughly anemic, which we've already talked about as being kind of, you know, bad. It is hard to maintain. This code will only grow in complexity. It's only going to get worse as we add more concerns. It is clearly not testable. There are way too many collaborators. There's no clear point to the object. It's going to be a real pain to write anything but an integration test for. And then finally, uh, the person who's written it has clearly never heard of the single responsibility principle in their life. Okay? Now, in defense of CRUD, for all the bashing on it, there are some good things here. All right? CRUD has a very, very low barrier to entry. If you can uh, normalize a database, you can build a CRUD application. It's that simple. It's also easy to follow, provided that you can keep the entire domain and all its rules in your head, uh, because there's nothing in the code outside of maybe your form validation that's going to help you get any of this right. It's not encoded anywhere in the design. And sometimes all you really want is data entry. I mean, it's not as often as we think it is in the industry, but sometimes it really, really is. So I might have some kind of really fancy insurance calculator uh, that's well-designed, well-tested, uh, but it maybe needs some actuary tables that are updated in a database once a year. And for that updating of the tables, why not build a CRUD application? It's simple. It's easy. It's not important to my business. And then finally, CRUD isn't always a developer's fault. If you have a bad project manager or a subpar UX person who just hands you designs that are nothing but overview pages and edit forms, you have very little choice but to build a CRUD application, in my experience. All right? But I think we can do better. And I think one of the ways that we can do better is by adding something called a service layer to this application. Now, service is like the most overused term in all of IT right now. I mean, we got a service layer, a service container, a web service, a service-oriented architecture, domain service, stateless service, software service, platform service, whatever service, I mean, delivery service, laundry service. We have a lot of services is what I'm saying. So I want to be really clear about what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about something called an application service. You're like, God, another service. All right? But this is basically just a service layer, and I'm going to use the two interchangeably. The reason I like uh, the term application service, I picked it up from this book, Implementing Domain Driven Design, is that it emphasizes the role of this service layer as being uh, tying different concerns together to create what's essentially the application. And we'll talk about that again a bit later. The way it works in practice, though, with an MVC app is that you just have a model and a controller normally, and the service layer kind of butts in there like an unwelcome house guest. All right? And you might be thinking, OK, Ross. Why would we do that? I mean, if three layers didn't cut it, why is four going to magically be better? Well, if we turn to the good book, you'll find a chapter here written by a guy named Randy Stafford, uh, who Fowler asked to write about service layers. And in there, he highlights two main reasons to build a service layer. The first one is that you have multiple user interfaces that consume the same domain logic. All right? And that might not have been too common when the book was written. I don't know. I wasn't there. But I would argue that for us today, this is practically the norm. Like, how many of you here have a website and a REST API that let you do some of the same things? Or you have a website and a cron job or a command line admin interface that's consuming the same logic, or a queue worker from Gearman or Beanstalk. These are all different interfaces consuming the same domain logic. He also hints at the idea that it's good for in-between logic or stuff that doesn't really fit in the controller or in the model, like database transactions. You don't want to duplicate those in every single controller. They don't belong there, but they don't really fit in the model either. That's a persistence concern. So an application service can be a good place to put that stuff. And then finally, there's another reason you might hear bandied about on Twitter or at conference hallways these days, which is that application services help you decouple your domain model from the underlying framework, because clearly frameworks are the source of all evil in PHP. All right. but. For all intents and purposes, uh, this is kind of true. Like me personally, when I'm building an application, I tend to base the controller and the view entirely on uh, whatever framework I'm using because it's easy, it's the most productive, it's also the least important part of my code. 
the service layer itself ha sometimes has components or libraries from this framework or from another. Ooh, mood lighting. <laughs> Romantic. Anyways, so we have that stuff in here, and it uses a couple components, um, event dispatchers or validation libraries, something like that. Um, and then finally, the model itself is decoupled from the rest of this mess, uh, usually maybe except for a couple value object libraries or a couple validators, something like that. All right, so it's kind of a standalone piece. Now it's a whole lot of jibber jabber. Let's talk about actually building a simple service layer. All right. So an easy way to go about doing this is, as a quick rule of thumb, uh, just think about what code would I want to reuse if I had multiple user interfaces. I would say in the case of our giant controller here, it's probably the stuff about you know setting it up and then the associated objects with it. So what I'm going to do is basically an extract class refactoring. And I'm going to pull this out. I'm going to put it in a new uh, class called to do service. And it's going to have a method called add task. And I'm going to require all the different pieces here as formal parameters. All right. By the way, incidentally, to do service is a really crappy name for a service. Please name these actually after something that's maybe related to your domain, like reminders or journal or something like that. But I'm lazy. Anyways, so we're going to have this in here. So there's no way that you can invoke this method incorrectly because it requires everything explicitly. All right. And then we'll just dump that code in here. Ta-da, simple little service layer. Now, you'll notice that we also took a fair number of the collaborators along with us, like the repository, the audit log, stuff like that. I would usually inject these here through the constructor with whatever DI layer you're using. You know, if you've got a factory class that builds your application, same thing. All right. Um, so we've got that in there. Now, one of the things I would normally do as well here is if you've got different collaborators that you're, you're using in the service layer, I would begin encapsulating all access to any of those. Okay, and this might seem like a little bit overdone or a bit over-engineered, but it has some serious benefits because you know what's accessing what now. All right, so if we cut back to our controller, having done this refactoring, you'll find that it's already a lot more high level and it reads better. Now I'm finding a to-do list by ID. I throw a four or four if it's not there. I add a task to it and I redirect the user. This is a lot simpler. This is easy to follow, right? And if we add an extra concern, like some extra piece of logging or whatever, then it's not going to mess the controller up. So uh, this also uh, begins to enable other things, like if we wanted to build a super hipster command line task management application, then that's pretty much peanuts now, right? We could just dump it in there because the important code is all inside this service class. All right. Now, this is also, in very, very simple applications, a decent point to begin going ahead and drying up the rest of the code in, in terms of don't repeat yourself. So stuff like this not found exception, if we want that thrown everywhere, you could conceivably go ahead and begin putting that inside the service layer. So you could do something like, hey, find by ID, dump the exception in there, and you didn't have to modify the entire application. Now keep in mind, once you start doing this, that no trace of your user interface layer should exist inside the service layer. All right. Uh, so we're not using an HTTP exception here anymore. We're using a specific named exception. Okay. Now, if we turn back to the same UI code again here, it's once again a little bit simpler. We try and find something by ID. We add a task to it, and we redirect the user. That's a step forward. Okay. Now, you might be asking, what a, why don't we go ahead and move this find by ID stuff into the add task method as well? Uh, well, that's true. You could, but you begin to sort of close off some doors at this point. Uh, for example, if on the command line interface I wanted to refer to it by name rather than ID, uh, you know, I still have to oops, pass it in there instead. So you want your user interface, your service layer, to be close to your uh, use cases, but not too close. Now that joke makes sense. Oops. Okay. So we have that stuff here. All right. Now that's not the only way to go about doing it, though. Uh, for example, uh, we could, uh, instead of passing around the object itself that we want to modify, we could also pass around the ID instead. And this is just as good. We could say find ID by name, and then we pass that into the service layer as well. Uh, usually you would do this as some sort of value object, so you get really strict type checking. And this is a great maneuver as well if you want some extra isolation. So it depends a little bit on what you want to do. But whether you use objects or whether you use um, IDs, just be consistent in what your service layer accepts. Pick one, pick the other, but not both. Okay. Now, this is going to feel really, really crazy because you're like, why am I just taking this stuff and then wrapping it with one-line functions again? What's, what's the benefit of this? And the easiest benefit that I can show you without getting into anything deeper, which we're going to, uh, is that 
it makes it really simple to add extra behavior without having to modify several callers. So I could add a cache to this method without having to go hunt and peck or everywhere in the application. Now, that's a lot of technical advantages. Let's talk about some indirect ones as well. I think that this has had a great effect on the readability of the code. Every class feels more high level. They're easier to isolate. They're easier to test. There's also a certain level of junior protection here. You've got this great big interface running down to the middle of the application. And that means that you could divide up your team a little bit easier, a little bit better. You could also, for example, you know, change something on one side without having it break something on the other side, hopefully. Or at least you're having the beginnings of that here. Uh, it's also got a great element of discoverability. Uh, if I'm looking at a, uh, a CRUD application for the first time, and I'm just looking at your database tables basically, I don't really know what your application does. I don't know what it allows you to do. Whereas if I look at the method signatures on your service, I have a pretty good idea. So at this point, you might be thinking, hey, mission accomplished. We're basically done. We've built a simple service layer. Um, there's just one little detail we need to wrap up. Our model is still, uh, what's the technical term? Dumb as a box of rocks. We've done absolutely nothing to help our model, which is what we started with as kind of a premise here. Um, so I hate to go return to the king on you, but that's a fake ending. We're not even a third of the way through yet. Okay. So this leads to the question, where's my logic? Every application has some level of business logic. And if it's not in the model, then where is it? Well, what happens usually in PHP is you start using service classes, and that begins to leach the logic out of the model. All right, so I would argue that this stuff right here is an important chunk of business logic. It doesn't look like it because it's composed of just setters, but it's really an implicit way of saying some really important things. Like, what is the relationship between a task and a to-do list? What are the required things that I have to give in order to create a task? You know, it has to be a description and a priority. That's important stuff here, but you can't see it because it's in the form of setters. All right? So if we turn once again back to the good book, you'll find a description of what it is we've written. It says, organizes business logic by procedures where each procedure handles a single request from the presentation. That's close to what we've done, except it's not talking about a domain model. It's talking about something called transaction scripts, which are kind of a halfway point. Like on one end of the scale, you've got CRUD. On the other end, you've got domain model. And transaction scripts are this nice little place in the middle. Right? And that's not a bad place to be, actually. I mean, transaction scripts are very simple. I mean, you've seen how we can implement one in just a couple minutes. Uh, and they're definitely more flexible than a CRUD application, at least. The problem with the transaction script is that they don't scale quite as well. And I don't mean performance scaling, which I'm actually not that interested in. I'm talking about complexity scaling. Like, as our application gets harder and more complicated and adds more features, it will get messier. And it will have more concerns to deal with. So if that's the kind of stuff that we're worried about being in a model, what belongs in the service layer, then? Well, if it's not this stuff, then I would argue it's this stuff. This is the kind of thing that you might want to put in a service layer. Okay. Uh, ultimately, a service layer is meant to be about orchestration. This is the key word here. It is not meant to do anything on its own. It is meant to tie together a bunch of different concerns that are standalone, but tie them together into an application. And that's why I like the term application service, personally. All right. Uh, so things like database transactions, security, maybe notifications or logging, perhaps even bulk operations if you want to get fancy. These are things you could conceivably put inside of, a, uh, inside of a service layer. The key pattern here is facade. We are not adding behavior to any of these models. We are just tying them together. Right? So you've often heard the term fat model, skinny controller. Think fat model, skinny service layer as well. All right? So with that stuff in mind, let's do some rethinking about what it is we've built. If we look at our service here, you can kind of break this stuff down into two categories. We have write methods, which change something, like add task. And we have read methods, like find by ID, find by latest list. And the reads outnumber the writes, so let's give them attention first. So we're going to remodel our reading by refactoring our repository again. Okay. So if we look back at our service layer here, this is, this is pretty simple code. It's easy to follow. But this stuff right here is basically adding behavior. Right? We want to try and make our service layer as thin as possible, and this doesn't really belong here, so we need to get it out. I mean, the question is, where should it go? We're clearly using some sort of like repository or database layer here, which doesn't throw exceptions when something is not found. So how are we going to shoehorn that behavior in? I mean, it's not like we can just go in and you know, create objects that work how we think they should. <laughs> oh, wait, we can. So let's try that for a change. All right? So let's create an interface, to-do repository. These are the methods that are important on it. 
These are the ones we're going to use. All right. So we'll start off with that, and we're just going to go ahead and create a to-do database repository that implements that interface. Okay. And then we're going to have a find by ID, and we'll basically plot the exact same code in there. It's, again, a simple extract, extract class refactoring. All right? And this feels better. It's much more consistent here. It's only in one place. It's only in one way. Now, you might be thinking, that's cool, Ross, but I'm not made of time or money. I don't have time to run around with a raw database connection and do all this object mapping myself. That does not interest me. I'm busy doing it with Doctrine or Propel or whatever it is you know, that you want. And that doesn't throw exceptions. So how can I make that happen? Well, you want to know how to fix that? Boom, fixed. All right. All we did was instead of using their repository directly, we wrapped it in our repository. And I know you're thinking like, oh, repository exception. That's crazy. But honestly, it's a matter of not which object it is. It's a matter of interfaces here. That's what we really care about. And this is the interface that we care about. The to-do repository is the important interface in this circumstance. All right? This is Doctrine's repository interface. And it is a very, very good interface for Doctrine. I like Doctrine a lot. That is not a knock on it. But between this interface and this interface, this is the one I want to support. This is the one I deal with, and this is the one I care about. So that's what you should be using. All right, so if we cut back to the to-do service, having made these changes, bada bing, bada boom, much simpler. Now, finally, this list is a little bit more complicated because you could make an argument that this stuff right here is orchestration. We are orchestrating how a cache and a repository behave in unison. Um, but at the same time, it kind of doesn't make sense, though, because the service class is meant to tie things together, and this is still kind of adding behavior, which is not what we want. Just think about it from a unit test point of view again here. We're, we would be testing two different things. All right? So, boom. Let's extract that code. Let's bring it to the repository. <coughs> much cleaner, much simpler. You could also go a step further here, though. Because we're using a single interface for this stuff, and that's separate from a concrete implementation, I could do something like this. I could create a caching to-do repository, which is basically a decorator object. It takes an actual, uh, an actual inner repository, which could be the database one, a mock one, whatever you want, and just encapsulate that. Okay? And that seems like a lot of objects. So how would we tie this together? Well, do it in your, da in your DI layer. So you might start off with like a doctrine repository. You put your own wrapper around that to get the interface you want. And then you have a caching thing on top of that, which you can turn on or off if you so choose. And then you encapsulate the whole thing with a service. Right? And I know that sounds crazy. All right? It looks totally over-engineered. But if you go out and form me and you go home and try it, I guarantee you'll notice a couple things. One, unit testing gets a lot, lot easier. Two, you have a lot more composability in turning like features on and off. And three, you'll never want to go back to the old way. Promise. Right? If you ever have doubts about this, just remember the inverse biggie law, which is commonly stated as mo classes, mo decoupling, and reduced overall design issues. Admittedly not as catchy, but. Okay. Now, in particular, finder methods do proliferate at a crazy rate, especially if your uh, database objects are too big. So you may have a design issue. You want to go in and shrink those back down again. Um, but a different way of doing it would be to consider something like a criteria pattern. So instead of like individual search uh, methods, you have one that takes multiple parameters to kind of describe the search you want to do. That's the common advice anyways. But it turns out that building a criteria uh, pattern thing here from scratch is surprisingly difficult. Uh, so you might want to use something like Doctrine Criteria in order to give you a head start, but it's, it's not that bad. Now, we still need to do something about improving the writing in our application, um, but let's take a brief interlude here and talk about what probably seems like an extreme proliferation of classes in our application at this point, because it's, it's really going all over the place, right? Especially, we're only focusing on one object right now, the to-do list, but that's already got a service, it's got a repository, and as we continue to add stuff like a task, well, that'll probably need a service, it will need a repository as well, you'll need tags, and then you just melt some cheese on top of this sucker and you've got a big steaming pile of lasagna code. Okay? Which, if you've never worked with a lasagna code, it is the worst type of code. All right? It is the opposite of spaghetti code, uh, where you basically have so many layers that are stacked up on top of each other that if you want to modify anything, you have to cut through all of them at the same time. True story. I once worked on, a, uh, on an uh, application where if you wanted to add a new field from the database level all the way up to the user interface, then you had to modify the code in seven different places. It was the worst. Okay. So don't ever build this, please. Instead, try and reason about what you're doing. Don't just follow some template because some guy at a conference told you what to do. Um, one way you could approach this differently is to be more intelligent about how you design your models. 
Uh, something the DDD guys do a lot is create aggregates, which is basically where you have an aggregate root. That's the to-do list in this case. And it basically manages the life cycle of models that only make sense when used by it. So you might have a single to-do service here with lots of collaborators like a repository, an audit log, whatever, but you're talking about a group of models rather than an individual one. And this can cut down on what seems like a crazy number of classes. Now, over time, you might be tempted to keep making these bigger and bigger. Like you say, well, all to-do lists are actually done by a user, so this all belongs under the user service, technically. Uh, but that's probably too big, all right? You want to keep it a bit smaller. So keep, take the user service from one way, the to-do service another there, and if they have to communicate with each other, that's okay. You can have references between them or something like that. But don't just like tie them together because they're that way in the database. I mean, the user could be split off in the future to a, uh, an external REST API or something. And then you're kind of, what's the technical term? Screwed. Okay, so if you're gonna do this and you're gonna let them communicate between each other, you know what goes really, really well here? Interfaces. Interfaces go great with everything. Don't just pass the raw user. Uh, pass in a value object, pass in an ID, pass in some kind of uh, alternate implementation of a user, something more specific to the to-do list, whatever you want, all right? But interfaces are your friend. And remember that services aren't only for entities. Uh, they're basically facades, and facades are meant to simplify any interface. So the scale can differ anywhere from like it's one class to 10 classes to 20 classes to whatever. All right. Just remember the quality of implementation matters. If you have a really crappy service layer that nobody likes working with, I guarantee you your colleagues will find you in a back alley one night and stab you with a shiv made from the plastic of your own keyboard. Don't be that guy. All right. So with that in mind, let's talk about remodeling the writing in our application. When we last left that stuff, we were here on the add task method and we were talking about how this stuff right here is the business logic in our application, okay? So we're gonna bring that stuff to the model where it rightfully belongs, all right? And that can be pretty straightforward again. We're just gonna have a method, add task, we pass these things into it, and it's set up now. And the important thing is that we both set up the task and we do the binding to the to-do list here, okay? Now, it is still possible to build this thing incorrectly inside the model. So the task should still enforce its own integrity. So we could require it with a constructor. That way you can't instantiate it unless you have the required stuff. Now, that's great in theory, but there is a catch here. Uh, many of your ORMs still need a reference on the child object, the task, that refers to the parent. Because they can't magically figure out that one is you know, the child of the other. They need the ID, the reference, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so if you have to do this, then you can pass it into the constructor, you can hide it in some way. Um, that's okay, it's a lesser sin. But if you do do this, do not compound your mistake by putting a getter and a setter for the to-do list on the task, all right? Because that way lies madness, all right? So we're just pretending it's not there. Now, once we turn back to the service having done this, again, it reads a little bit shorter. It's a little bit more compact. Uh, and it feels more like this is about orchestration, right? We're now tying together a bunch of different concerns. The domain model is one of them, but we're also tying together these other things, and again, that emphasizes the idea that this class is what brings stuff together to make an application, okay? So this also paves the way, once we have these things in place, to begin adding real business logic to your models. And by real business logic, I mean the type of BS examples you only see in talks like this. Like, if I have more than 10 tasks, we'll change the status to unrealistic. Who has these problems in real life? I don't know. But we'll pretend that this is a valid one. A good hint that you're on the right track, though, is when you can write meaningful tests for your models. If you can write unit tests that actually cover something inside your models, it means there's logic in there, so you're on the right track, okay? But you won't be doing this long before you notice that you have some problems making everything work together. I mean, the model is the boss. The model should be in charge, but the model also has a very limited scope. Uh, so right now we're fixing that by, uh, for example, mentioning every single concern here inside the to-do list service class. So we just have another list. If we wanted to add some extra piece of logging or whatever, it would have to be injected here and put at the bottom of the class as well. So that's only gonna grow over time. It's gonna add more collaborators, more complexity, so on and so forth. Uh, also, what happens when we have conditional logic inside of our models? Like, how are we gonna send an email every time we get over 10 tasks, for example? Are we gonna like duplicate that check here inside the, that, that's silly. That's the opposite of everything we've been trying to do, 
And then finally, what happens if you have to communicate like over a network, like send these things automatically to a printer or whatever? Uh, that's, that's like async. That could be really, really hard to do. And the service shouldn't be necessarily caring about that. So we need something new, something better, something eventier. Yes, domain events, that would work. Now, if you're not familiar with domain events, they're a really, really common pattern that you've probably seen uh, in jQuery, you know, that thing that runs in browsers. Uh, it's an observer. And we're just going to use it in a fashion you might not have seen before. All right, so I'm going to throw a couple new lines of code here on the screen at once. Don't flip out or anything. All right, here we go. We're going to have a this raise method. And then we're going to toss in a new task added event. And that's going to take whatever the important things were that just changed. Okay, so let's talk about the event first because that's the easiest thing here. It's really just a message, okay? We're gonna pass these things in here through the constructor and then we're gonna probably put some getters on here so you can read it, but it is basically a simple, immutable little message object. It has no real logic of its own and that might seem kind of hypo hypo uh, hypocritical, is the word I'm looking for. It might seem kind of hypocritical because I've been ra ranting about anemia the whole time, but think about this more like a data structure than an actual object, okay? So we're going to set up this task added event. Now, that's pretty straightforward, but what about this raise method? What is that thingamabobber? Well, we take the to-do list here, and we're going to add a few more lines of code. Bear with me. We're going to have a pending events array. All right, starts off empty. And the raise method just appends an event to that array. And then finally, we have an extra method here, release events, sometimes called dq or collect. All right, and it just returns a copy of whatever uh, events are in there and then resets it. So it kind of like unloads all the pending events and it returns this stuff. All right, now the only thing, oh, good point here. Um, this is an excellent use case for a trait. It's not enough code for a base class, certainly doesn't justify it, but it's just enough you don't want to duplicate it everywhere. So trait would be a good move here. Now the only thing we're missing at this point is a dispatcher because we're not going to bind every single listener to every single model. That'd be hugely inefficient and a total waste. All right, so we're going to take a dispatcher here. Now, we would probably do that inside the service layer. So we would kick out all these individual concerns like the auto log, the mailer, and stuff like that, and we would just replace that stuff with dispatching these events. And then things like sending the email, for example, could be relegated out of the service and into an email listener object where it just waits for whatever the proper event is and then triggers the same stuff. All right. And this is really, really loosely coupled at this point. It might seem like a lot of boilerplate, but at the same time, you can reuse these listener classes for all sorts of things. They often have a common set of dependencies, and the listener classes themselves are meant to be thin. They are kind of like controllers in their own right, so they're just referring the work off to something else that's actually doing it. Okay, So this works out really, really well then. Um, and now we can also begin to dispatch multiple events if we want. For example, you can send zero events with the method, you can send lots of events with the method, and it's easy to tie this stuff together. Just add events when you need them. So there are a couple of nice things about domain events as a whole. We get to keep the logic here in the model, where it belongs, which has been a central theme. It prevents a big ball of mud from appearing within our service, so as we get more collaborators and more little bits of logic that accumulate there over time, we've now reduced that to kind of a fixed amount of functionality. And individually, the pieces are all thin and easy to test. If I'm writing unit tests for the model, I check that it raises the events. If I'm uh, testing the service layer, then I'm checking that the events get the flow from one thing to another. And then if I'm testing the listeners here, I'm testing that they pass them off to the appropriate collaborators. Every piece here is really, really small. And it's also a great way to communicate over a network because you can simply serialize these little immutable data structures, pump them off over a network for whatever piece of communication, and then have things happen out of process. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we only pass scalars or simple value objects here instead, because you can't change those. You don't let events change in the past, unless you have a time machine. There's some less nice things about domain events, though. And they basically all boil down to exactly the same thing. Humans hate debugging events, especially if it's an event on an event on an event on an event. In practice, that doesn't happen nearly as often as you fear, but if you are going to use domain events, it's worth spending a few hours to build in some development logging, uh, maybe some debug commands so you can see whatever listeners are just kind of hanging there waiting for stuff to happen. That gives you a much better overview of the system as a whole. Okay? So we've been talking an awful lot about how to get the model and the service layer communication right, but that's only half of the integration story here. We also need to talk about how to consume the stuff from our controller and view. All right? So let's talk about that. Now, the big danger that we have at this point here 
is that we are allowing full-fledged access to the model in all the controllers. We are just returning the entire model and letting you do whatever you want with it. And in most cases, that's going to go correctly. We're going to pass it back into the task, uh, into the task service, and you know, add the task. But if you have a new developer who's just coming to the project, for example, and they only follow their autocomplete, they're like, oh, well, this is like a database mapper. I get the thing back, and oh, wait, there's an add task method here, and I just invoke that directly, and oh, I want to rename something too, and oh, wait, I need to pass it in to save it. And there's like more ways to get this wrong than there are to get it right, and that's a sign of a bad API. So let's try and think about this in a different fashion. All right, because right now what we have is essentially some implicit communication or maybe even coupling between the model and the controller. If you change one, it's possible to maybe break the other. The service layer is not being a good layer here. It is basically letting the model run around and poke its nose into different places in the application where it doesn't belong. All right, it's like a bad puppy. So uh, you should instead do as a wise man once said and keep them separated. Da -da -da -da. Yes. So one of the ways we can do that is beginning to isolate these things from each other. So we can bring in something into play called a view model. Uh, if you're into MVVM stuff, that's different than what I'm talking about here. Don't worry about it. Okay. So it's a really, really simple pattern. All we do is instead of passing back the to-do list in the find by ID method, we're going to wrap that in some other little simple object. And I'm calling it a to-do DTO here, which is short for data transfer object. All right, it's just transferring data. It's again, more like a message or a little thing like that. Okay. And it's only going to give you a subset of the functionality here. And it could be a decorator, it could be copying state, it could be built by a cron job, doesn't matter. Okay, it's a totally different thing. And it's usually pretty much logicless. It might have a few helper methods, but that's kind of where it stops. Okay. Now, another way of thinking about view models is also to bring structure to things that you often have implicitly, like who here has ever had to build a crazy report out of some 14 line SQL query with a thousand joins in there, right? It happens all the stinking time. And you usually pass that back as some sort of data array that's totally untyped and you format it in one particular template that nobody can read or understand anymore. So a better way of doing that might be to actually put some form, put some structure in that thing. You know, so create an annual goal report object that expects something in a particular format. Put your helper methods in there, write unit tests for it. Right? If you can do that kind of thing right here for a uh, shapeless blob of data, you can do the same thing for your models. It's a really, really powerful concept. But at the end of the day, it ain't rocket science. Okay. So what I think is more interesting is if we reverse it and we use DTOs not for output, but for input instead. Which leads to us going commando, by which I'm clearly referring to the 1980s Arnold Schwarzenegger classic. All right. In case anybody's wondering. Now. This is almost the same thing, but in the opposite direction. We're going to create a simple little message object, which is called a command. And I'm super lazy in this scenario, and I'm just using public properties. You might want a static factory or some getters and setters in real life. But as I said, I'm really lazy. OK, so I have this little command object. And I'm going to fill it in in the controller. All right, so I'm just binding all that data from the request directly to it. And at first glance, this might seem like more lines of code than you, we had in previous examples, but it's simpler code. And if you were using a serializer or using a form library, this would be peanuts, right? So we're going to fill that command object in, and then we're going to dump it into the to-do service, but not into an add task method. We're going to dump it into an execute method instead, OK? Now, the way this whole thing works as a flow is that the controller fills this message in, it dumps it in the service, and the service acts kind of like a router. All right? There's one handler object out there for every command, just one handler, OK? But there's a whole list of them. And the service's job is to act like a matchmaker and find this command's soulmate, you know, the one handler it was meant to be with. Right? So it pipes it on through to there. All right, now, how does it do that? Well, we replace the add task method with the execute, as I said, but it needs an actual strategy for doing that. To be honest with you, I don't care. I mean, you could do like git class on the command and map it in an array. You could have command git name and then have that be the name of a handler. Uh, you could have the command execute itself. Fowler likes this as long as there's no dependencies you know, that you actually need extra, which there always are. But anyways, this is, this is you know, whatever strategy works best for you and your framework. I don't care. All right. So what goes in a handler then? Well, it's basically everything that's left over, which in this case turns out to be not much. We just look it up in the repository. We add the task, and maybe we dispatch the domain events. But that's pretty much it. 
And this might seem, again, like a lot of boilerplate, but the entire service now is completely reusable, completely composable. And this stuff can, again, have similar dependencies, so you could use the same uh, handler for multiple operations, multiple actions. Easy peasy. All right. So the, once you start doing this for a little while, you realize that, well, this works for the to-do list service, but we could actually extend this further. I could have, instead of, like, a different command dispatching thing for every single service, I could have one generic command bus for all write operations in my class, in my entire application. I mean, you still probably want services or something like that for doing the reads, but the command bus can handle all the writes. And you just need one, really, because it's all routing under the hood. Now, um, there's a really, really smart guy named Benjamin Everly uh, who wrote a couple years ago that if you have a service layer, he likes having this kind of command dispatcher interface. And the reason for that is that it's really, really simple because the interface is just one method. So you can easily extract that into an interface and then write your own implementations of it. So you could have uh, whatever works for your application here, but you could also create something that lazy loads from your DI layer directly. Uh, you could add validation behavior here as a decorator again. So like if the command is not valid in some way, then you throw an exception, otherwise you pass it on down the chain. And so if I want you know, like specifically symphony validation on my command, I can just drop some annotations on here and I'm done the possibilities are practically endless. You can do anything and everything you want with it, all right? Because it's a very, very simple interface. Uh, some other possibilities I've seen in real life, logging, log every single command that comes through. Uh, database transactions are a good fit. Uh, if you've got a unit of work so you can inspect the identity map on something, you can do the domain dispatching, uh, the domain event dispatching, like capture all the changed entities and send their, domain, uh, send their events out. All right, so lots and lots and lots of possibilities here. So commands in general. Fewer dependencies per class, more layers, but simple layers, and very, very easy to test. We're really cutting this stuff down to its core now. And this, this, isn't, this is not an either or scenario, though. I can use view models and commands at the same time. Um, in fact, that will give us complete isolation here. Uh, so every time I want to make a write, I would shoot a command into the service layer. And every time I want to make a read, then I would get a view model back. And this is really cool. And one of the things I like the most about this approach for PHPers especially is that it gives us CRUD for the framework, but domain model for the Chewy Center. And that's because, frankly, there's a dirty secret that a lot of people won't tell you about when you start doing DDD stuff like this, which is that your average PHP framework really, really likes you to have Gitter Setter-based models. I mean, things like forms, templates, validators, they all love Gitter Setter-based models because they can do meta very easy metaprogramming and figure out how to operate with that. On the other hand, We've got the service layer in place. I can use the domain model uh, for things like tough logic, capturing semantics, testing. Uh, that's a better fit. So I can get more of the, the best of both worlds approach. Okay. So if you're using uh, commands and view models here at the same time, uh, over time, you begin to might maybe possibly notice that they'll start to diverge. Uh, you'll see that maybe your commands are sending in fewer properties than your view models are reading, or that they don't really begin to resemble each other very much. That can be a natural flow of your application, or it can be a sign that perhaps the modeling is actually different for uh, commands and for view models. Which leads us to the last section of our talk, a really hot buzzword right now, CQRS. Now, CQRS is kind of hard to show you because on the surface, it looks the same. Uh, this is the exact same controller I showed you in the last example. Uh, what's different here is the concept of CQS, or command query separation. This was in, uh, discovered, invented, whatever you prefer, by a guy called Bertrand Meyer, a uh, very famous OOP here. And he theorized that all operations, any method you call, can be classified as one of two things. It is either a command, which changes data, but returns nothing new, or query, which reads data, but changes nothing in the process of doing so. And don't confuse the terms command and query with like the command pattern we saw in the last section, or query like a database query. He means any method call whatsoever. All right. He says that these are two different things. Uh, if you like uh, REST, then think about it like the difference between a git and a post. Okay. Now, a few years later, and by that I mean a lot of years later, back in 2009 or 2010, a guy named Greg Young came up with this idea of CQRS, or Command Query Responsibility Separation. And his insight was that uh, if you look at your average model, then you can see that many of the methods here already break down along those same lines. So we have a rename and add task, and those are commands. And the stuff on the bottom are naturally queries. But what if these are actually two different responsibilities, as in terms of single responsibility principle? 
Well, then you would have two models, one that covers the reads and one that covers the writes. All right? So you might actually split it into two different objects like this, where the top one is making the changes and throwing domain events for that stuff, and then the bottom one, there can be multiple read models, is receiving those domain events and updating itself in order to generate like new visualizations on the fly. Okay? So if you're having a hard time picturing this, think about um, my to-do list application where the marketing guys come in and they say, hey, we would really like to have this feature where for every to-do list, I can easily see all of the users who were ever involved with this to-do list in any way, shape, or form. And you'd be like, holy crap, that's, that's actually kind of hard to figure out and it's kind of performance intensive and uh, you know, we sort of did a lot of work in separating the two things out. So just slapping a get participating users method on here is kind of screwing the pooch. Um, so CQRS gives us an alternative to that. What we could do is create a to-do list model on top where we just you know, make the changes themselves, we add the tasks, but the stuff on the bottom that could be generated from a cron job, we could be doing it over an API, we could be you know, building these things asynchronously, it doesn't matter, right? We can build that view in any way we prefer. It could be a combination of data-based stuff and remote API stuff, it doesn't matter, all right? Uh, in practice, this often means that you have like an ORM entity for the stuff on top because the right model is the one with all the logic, and this one on the bottom is maybe an SQL query or some combination of data, okay? The important concept here is that read and write are two different systems, uh, like a user and a shopping cart. They have a relationship with each other, one uses the other probably, but you wanna bring that same kind of split into play here. What does this do to the surrounding classes? Well, a lot of it looks the same actually. Um, command uh, pattern is often used here already with CQRS, like many people think that they're part of the same thing. So you would often have a handler like this, you would often have a service for doing reads like this, and they would be side by side identical. Uh, to the previous examples. The difference here is that the repository on the top and the repository on the bottom are two different repositories. The one on the top does the right models and it usually has only very simple finder functions, usually just a find by ID, and the one on the bottom is, you know, got more complex query stuff here, okay? And they return two different models. One returns a write model, one returns a read model. And this has some surprising effects throughout your application. Um, consider this code. We do this all the time. We create a new to-do list, we save it, and then we get the database ID back from it so we can redirect the user to a URL with that ID in it, right? Pretty standard. This will not work if you take CQRS seriously. Why? Because the actual writing of a new to-do list is a command, and commands can't return state, all right? Even an auto-generated ID that you're setting on a model you passed in here is extra state. It is maybe side-loading a return value, but it is basically doing that. Okay, so you cannot do this. Instead, what you most often see is people using UUIDs because these are unique, they're generated by the client, the rest of the stuff can pass it in, and it still knows what the ID is at the end of the day. I would redirect the user back to you know, a URL with the UUID in it instead. So there are a lot of different possibilities or ways to work around this, but the, the work of generating that ID is now in a different place. Uh, this is really low level, so maybe you can get a better picture of it here if I zoom out. Uh, this is a, a diagram I straight up stole from Martin Fowler's website because if I was trying to do it again, I would just be duplicating it. Uh, so straight up stole it. All right, what he says here is that in general, you have uh, a command model, what I call a write model here on the bottom, and a user comes along and makes a change in the UI. All right, and that goes in right here, which is basically our command bus. That gets piped into a handler, that makes some changes on the model, and then that stuff gets saved to the database. Sometime later, the same user or a different user comes along and makes a read and that goes through the query model or the read model, right? And that comes back out and gets displayed in the UI. Now Fowler says that in this case, the query model and the command model are communicating with each other through the database. Like they have an agreement or a contract about what those tables in the database look like, but they are still two different systems. One of the cool things about CQRS and one of the things that might make this split a little bit easier to visualize is the fact that we could actually use two different databases here. We could use uh, like MySQL here for the integrity for financial transactions and we could use Redis here in order to do it and deliver that in the most high speed way possible. Or we could do it the other way around or we could have like one write database, there's always one consistent write database, but we could have in any number of read databases, all right? However you wanna do that. Now, how does that stuff replicate between there? Because there is no magical Redis to MySQL adapter that I found yet. Well, the most common way is domain events. 
you know, the right model fires them, the read model listens to them and updates its own projection. Uh, but that's not the only way. I mean, you could use DB views like we had in the first example. Uh, you could use a big honking queue. I don't care. Right, but domain events are, are the number one way that people use. Uh, if you'd like to try and put this into action, uh, the Benjamin Eberly guy I mentioned earlier, total man crush, um, he wrote a CQRS library, or rather he ported it from C Sharp, and you can take a look at that. That was kind of the original one in PHP. Uh, the guys over at Candidate Labs uh, here in the Netherlands wrote a new one recently, more for event sourcing maybe, called Broadway. It is really good, and I'm still reading it, but I like the look of this a lot. And then finally, Greg Young, the guy who coined the term CQRS in the first place, has a couple hundred lines example that he feels illustrates the principles of the whole thing. It's written in C Sharp, but we're all big grown-ups here. We can, we can handle that, okay? Now, what are the pros and cons of CQRS? Because there are serious ones. So let's, let's talk about the cons here first. It is a big mental leap. It is a very different style of modeling than what we're used to. And if your team is not ready for that, that, that could cause some problems. It may not be the best thing to ro roll out. It is usually, like pretty much always, going to be more lines of code. Arguably simpler code, but more lines, more pieces. And in my opinion, it is not necessarily for every domain. Uh, Udi Dahan, who's a really well-respected OOPer, you know that because the sidebar on his website has like 40 recommendations about how awesome he is. Um, he says that unless your domain has an inherent race condition, you probably don't need CQRS. That's his take on it, at least. But often what you see in applications that do use it is that it's mixed. Like one high speed section of the application is using CQRS and another one is using CRUD to just fill in database stuff, right? So it's not an all or nothing approach. Now, what are the pros of using CQRS? Well, it is easy to scale. And this time I do mean it in the performance sense. Like because you would now have eventually eventual consistency in your application, you can control the speed at which changes replicate to users. It's very powerful. It's a great way if you're under a lot of pressure, a lot of speed. All right? It also bears complexity well. And I mean that if you have a very complicated domain model, this can be a useful way to model it or to picture it. It allows you to separate these things into smaller chunks. And it makes certain allowances that were traditionally very hard. It has great support for doing async, which is more and more important all the time. And it is probably the single best pattern we have for implementing event sourcing right now. Now, uh, event sourcing, you might not have heard of. It's still kind of making the rounds. Uh, it, it's kind of outside the scope of this talk, but I'll talk about it briefly because it goes really, really well with CQRS. Like, many people think they're often the same thing. Uh, the fundamental idea here is that instead of storing the current state in the database, like name is equal to Ross, age is equal to 29, hat is equal to Fedora, uh, instead, I would store the domain events that were triggered leading up to the current state. So I would have like Ross was born, Ross uh, went to school, uh, Ross got his first hat, Ross, you know. And then if I wanted to know what the current state of things are, I would take all of those events out of the database and I would replay them on top of the model one after the other. And you might think that's really, really slow, but in practice it's not. And by doing this, you actually enable a whole lot of really powerful, amazing stuff. Like if you're performance obsessed, you can kind of offset all the differences here by using it to generate snapshots. Like every 10 events, you know, do something you know, record a, a quick load version. It's not often necessary and kind of controversial, but you can do it. It is amazing for debugging, right? How did the client screw it up this time? Let me look in the database and see everything you did that led up to it. Audit logs. If you've ever built an application with a real audit log, you know how hard that is. And here it's basically something you get for free. It is a gold mine for business intelligence, all right? You can see and, and follow user flows whenever, anytime, in the past or, or maybe projecting in the future, I don't know. Uh, I have a theory personally you might be able to use this cap style to overcome network partitions because you can bundle the domain events up on one side and then send them over at a later date. Uh, I've seen some people talk about using this to build self-healing patches where you change like a calculation object and you replay the events that occurred previously and you get a new outcome, which is the correct one. All right, that's kind of bonkers, but think about it afterwards, it'll make sense. Or you could Google it, or you can ask me in the hallway, and I'll point you to some really smart people who know a lot about it. Okay, so that's all the time I have for you today. Um, I just want to leave you with this quote from Emerson. He says, "A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds." Now, that might sound like Emerson's trying to insult your I am, and I assure you that's absolutely not the case. What Emerson was trying to say is that you should believe whatever the best thing to believe is today, and tomorrow, if new facts come to light or new discovery is made you should switch over and believe whatever that points to instead.
And you shouldn't feel bad about changing your mind because you are believing whatever the best thing is day to day. I mean, in IT, we often call this strong opinions, weekly held. But maybe a better way to put it is strong techniques, weekly held. When we were using PHP 3, it was a lot of uh, procedural and imperative code. And it wasn't pretty, but it got the job done. In PHP 4 to 5, we were began doing simple OO. I mean, lots of inheritance, and again, not all of it good, but better. In PHP 5.3 and up, we're living in the era of composer, man. I mean, it's, it's all about tying stuff together and making it work. And pretty soon we'll be in PHP 7, and I don't know what that means yet, but I think it's going to be pretty cool. Some of what I'm talking about today might seem crazy, but try it in little doses, not the whole thing at once. If you want the most bang for your buck and you're building CRUD applications, try building a little transaction script thing. I think you'll like what it does. If you want to go a step further, roll out your first domain events. I really think you'll like what that, what that does to your code. All I can do is assure you that at the end of the day, people are doing this. It is working for them, and it can work for you too. Thank you very much. I have no idea what time it is, but the middle link here, Sean McCool's blog, is a great place to get more info. Thank you very much to these people. Thanks to these people. And I'd appreciate your feedback. Thank you very much. <laughs>